Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the GIS Sea Level Rise Seminar. Um, we're very glad to have Dr. Erin Pettit today. Um, she's an associate professor at the College of Earth, Ocean, and Atmospheric Sciences at uh, Oregon State University. Um, she's an expert in geophysics and glaciology. And her work focuses on dynamics of glaciers and ice sheets and geophysical properties of ice and interactions between ice and water. And uh, she's also the founder and director of Inspiring Girls Expeditions, uh, which motivates women to pursue their passions in science and outdoor activities through field expeditions um, that encourage girls' natural curiosities. And Dr. Pettit has received many awards, um, including the National Geographic Society Emerging Explorer Award and the Inspiring Women in STEM Award. Um, so uh, we're very glad to have her here. She'll be speaking today about uh, the Thwaites Eastern Ice Shelf, ongoing changes and potential for breakup and implications. So. Great, thanks, Patrick. Um, and I realized even though you put it through me before me, uh, I, I didn't catch that um, you had associate professor because I did just get promoted to full professor. So okay. I that. <laughs> it's fairly new though. <laughs> so um, great. Well, thank you for inviting me in, and uh, it's great to, to see everybody here. Um, and I am going to share my screen. Um, And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna be talking about the Thwaites. Hold on, I'm gonna open you guys all up because I like to see, see the audience, even if they're just names on the screen. <laughs> I gave this talk in person a couple of weeks ago um, and it was really a nice reminder of how much I like being in person, but it's also really fun to be able to do this for many people in many different places. Um, so I sort of liking the balance of sometimes online and sometimes in person. Um, so this is just a short video of what it can be like on the ice shelf. And uh, note that we do spend a lot of time making sure everybody feels safe and um, safe and warm, even in these storms. Uh, it's a it's a beautiful place to work. Antarctica, as many of us who've been down there know, it does have its challenges. Um, but as a team, we can all work together to really do some great science and keep everybody safe and warm. And that's always been my philosophy. So even though I show these kind of exotic or extreme situations, um, it's, a, it's a really great, great teamwork environment. And the work that I'm going to show today um, is actually the efforts of a huge team. And this is part of the International Thwaites Glacier Collaboration. Uh, I am the lead with Karen Haywood of the Tarzan team, which is one of eight projects that are kind of under this umbrella. There's other people also working at, at Thwaites through different, um, through different pathways. And many of these people are part of the Thwaites team, which is the ice ocean interactions team. Um, but I also want to point out that a, that a number of people from the um, from the Domino's team, which is focusing a bit more on uh, modeling and some remote sensing, and they've all contributed. So this is a long list, and there's probably more, many more. Um, and I really just want to point that out that there's um, this is really is a big collaborative project. And in the on the right here is um, is a sequence of satellite images from the Sentinel Sentinel One satellite of just showing the last six or eight years, I forget when this one starts, starts in 2014, so it last eight years. And it really does give you a sense of the dramatic fast changes that are happening. And some of the things I'm gonna talk about, you'll see this, you'll see this um, sequence over and over again, but one thing to note here are, is the change in this kind of fracture zone, and then these propagating fractures that go into the center of this, uh, of this ice shelf. We chose to study the Eastern ice shelf when we first started this, um, mostly because it was the only place we could land safely and get some work done. And we basically thought we were going to the most boring, unchanging part of the shelf area. Um, it was impossible to do any ground-based work here. So we've that's mostly been through satellite work. And uh, there's a team that's been there 
with helicopters a little bit recently. Um, so that's been really neat to see. But this was the only place we could really get on the ground and do some more detailed work of this fast changing environment. Um, and it's it's brought out a lot of really interesting, um, interesting things that we've learned both about this ice shelf, as well as about uh, what happens when an ice shelf is close to being close to being uh, done, gone. <laughs> and we don't know how long that's going to take. But so I wanted to step back and make sure we're all on the same page. And so here's Antarctica. The Thwaites Glacier is over in this western side. It actually sits pretty much directly below about Colorado. If you took the longitude directly south from Colorado, you would end up on Thwaites. Um, it's a big glacier in the media. They like to talk about it as the size of Florida. Um, the area that we're focused on is this very terminus area. And the light blue here is the um, is the ice is the eastern ice shelf and then the western ice tongue, which is now pretty much just a melange of icebergs. And a couple of the key things to note here is that this is there's about 120 kilometers of grounding zone here. So the Thwaites Glacier is a very wide glacier where it flows off the continent and into the ocean. Um, the eastern ice shelf uh, is about a thousand square kilometers. Um, and when we were there in 2019, it was flowing at about 600 meters per year. This Western ice tongue is, as I said, um, is now just a melange of icebergs and it typically flows at about 2000 meters per year. So it's, so it's flowing three times faster or it was in 2019. And uh, a little teaser is that this ice shelf now is flowing nearly a thousand meters per year. So just in the last three years, it has uh, increased its speed by 50% and is um, now only half the speed of this one, which gives us a, a thought, um, thoughts, thoughts to ponder on what the future of this area is. And I also just wanna reiterate, I know many of you on this call realize this, but it's always good to just think um, a bit more about why we really care about, care about areas like this. Um, global sea level rise is still increasing. The Thwaites Glacier is right now contributing about, or as of a few years ago, was contributing about 4% to global sea level rise. So this single glacier is contributing 4%. Um, and it could, that could creep up to 5% or more as this ice shelf breaks up and the Thwaites, um, and the Thwaites start to accelerate from its, um, off the ground, which was what we're already seeing. And as a reminder, um, every millimeter of sea level does matter. Um, as we saw this uh, just a little while ago with Hurricane Ian, the storm surges are getting worse. Um, in addition to the hurricanes themselves being worse, the effect the land area they can affect is worse. Right here in Oregon, the high tides are getting higher. There's a lot more infiltration of, of the high tides. And there's many other examples of this. So I just wanted to pull out to to kind of remind us um, why <clears throat> why these areas are really uh, critical to keep an eye on so that we can think about how to mitigate and what might be happening in the future in our coastal areas. So, um, and this, I just wanna kind of put, put the big picture in mind in terms of why Thwaites, not just where it is and why it matters, but why is Thwaites, um, warming and melting and accelerating more than any other many other places in Antarctica. And this has to do with the increasing westerly winds um, that go that go around the Antarctic continent. And these have been um, seen to increase. This is part of the southern annular mode. Um, <clears throat> and they have been increasing over the last 50 to 70 years. It's caused um, a couple of other things such as increased snowfall on the Antarctic Peninsula, changes in the phone wind, the phone wind dynamics there as well. Um, what happens here is that these increasing winds, um, they have a, a particular relationship with the coastline here and that those increasing winds end up driving warm water onto, um, onto the continental shelf because winds parallel to the coast will drive surface currents away from the coast, which then pulls in warm water um, at depth. And this area is particularly, the winds are just, are, are particularly aligned to bring that warm water 
strongly into the Thwaites and Pine Island region and the Getz ice shelf. There's a whole series of ice shelves along here. Um, and you can see that in the deep water temperature here and the mass loss through time. So what I want to talk about today is what's happening to this eastern ice shelf. As I said, we thought it was we were going to the kind of boring air part of Thwaites um, and uh, and on, and mostly it was the place that a plane was willing to land <laughs> because on the surface, it looked like it was very smooth and flat. There were very few, very few surface features and no crevassing that gave us this this simplified vision of the ice shelf. Um, but what I'm what we've learned since then is a number of things. Um, and what I want to talk about today is a couple of them. One that we have been losing grip on the this submarine seamount that is helping stabilize it, the pinning point. Um, it is fracturing. We see we see um, fractures that are propagating rapidly. We've seen uh, the development or we've we've recognized a weak zone where there where we didn't realize there was a weak zone before. And I'm going to talk just only a little bit about melting by the ocean. Um, it turns out this is an interesting story that is not all mine to tell, and we're not quite all sure what's happening there. There's a bunch of other people collaborating on this. Um, and I will mention that briefly, uh, but we don't have all the answers on what's happening with the melt. Um, there's a whole other group that's also working on this area um, in uh, that's looking in detail at the basal melt in this area. We've been looking at basal melt more distributed around the ice shelf. So this is just to give you a sense, this is a flying along the, the ice shelf front. Um, so this is maybe 30, 30 meters high of a 300 meter thick ice shelf. This is sea ice in front. And there is a bit of a rift that you can see behind it here. Um, and then way back in the distance is the, um, is the upstream grounded ice. And you can just see it off in the distance. And we always, when we were on the ground there, we always had an opportunity to look back upstream and recognize where that ice was coming from, um, from upstream. So the really simplified look of an ice shelf uh, is to think about this cross section going simply through it. Here's the, the smaller version of the more complicated cross section that I showed before. Um, but if we really simplify it down, we can think of it as a bit of a force balance um, to try to get a sense of what's happening. And this is the simplest version. So we have our gravitational driving stress that's pulling ice off the continent onto the ocean. Um, where the ice is grounded, there's also a basal drag, and that can vary depending on how much um, how much water is is getting into the bottom, where it might be frozen, and, and details of the topography there. Um, once you get out onto the ocean, um, I always like to say that that ice glaciers actually really are they're they're kind of scared of the water. They're not very good swimmers. So once they get out onto the ocean. They're trying their best to hold together, and that's these longitudinal stresses. They're trying to, they're, there's a lot of tension on them to spread out, and they're just, it's just doing its best to hold itself together. Um, often, in many places, they actually fracture. If there's nothing to hold it together, then it will fracture. Um, in this case, we have a little area of uh, a, that submarine seamount. That the that the ice shelf has been able to hold on to, and this is like you know the kid in the water who's scared just wants to hold on to the side of the swimming pool and hold on for dear life, and that's what that's what I see glaciers doing all over the world. They like want to swim in the water, but they get scared and then they hold on to whatever they can. Um, in this case, it's the submarine seamount, and that provides an additional um, a, an additional uh, buttressing stress. That can turn this longitudinal tension that the that the ice shelf feels into a compressive force to basically provide some stabilizing in here. So when you have the tension, it's going to want to fracture and break apart. When you have that compression, it can hold itself together. So often our question with these ice shelves is um, is how much is this buttressing? Where might it be fracturing? And what's um, what might it do in the future? This is a very simplified two-dimensional version of this. Um, in the real world, we're working in three dimensions. 
And so there are a few other things that we are going to think about, and I'm going to talk about a bit more of those three-dimensional stresses, um, and I'll show you my three-dimensional little drawing here in a minute. Um, but the couple of the key points that I will be talking about um, is one that this pinning point that the glacier is so desperately holding on to is losing its grip, um, or the glacier is losing its grip on this pinning point. Um, and I'll show you our evidence for that. Um, second, that this shear zone, which is this area behind the pinning point, uh, has um, narrowed and weakened. And, um, and basically what that's doing is allowing the ice flow, instead of flowing into the pinning point and feeling that stabilizing buttressing force, it's now flowing alongside, it's sort of skimming past this pinning point. Um, and it's adjust, it's changing the way this pinning point is buttressing the flow and stabilizing it and causing some destabilizing. And part of that destabilizing is that these rifts are propagating into the center of the ice shelf. Um, and so I'll come back to a lot of this, um, these details uh, over the course of the talk. So here's now a uh, three-dimensional or the, the map view to go with the two-dimensional. Um, and so here we have the buttressing, um, the buttressing of the of the pinning point that's allowing for that compressional stress in here, except for the fact that we are now shifting to the shear zone. And I, uh, well, we'll get we'll get to that. So what you can have in these two dimension in this map view, you also end up having lateral stresses lateral resistance. Um, there was a pinning point down here that the that was um, that was supporting the western ice shelf and that's no longer really being supported very much, which is why this area is much looser. And again you have this basal drag everywhere along and the gravitational stress everywhere along. So the three-dimensional topography really does matter um, in the in we, when we really want to assess what's happening. So this is that same image, just to give you a chance to, to look at it again. And here you can see that the Western ice tongue is breaking up just downstream of the grounding zone. And um, this red line is the um, one of the recent grounding zones. Um, and actually it's the red line is changing through time in this image to show you some of the grounding zones um, through time. And what you can see is that there is an interaction between this western ice tongue, all of these icebergs getting pulled off, and the eastern ice, um, the eastern ice shelf. So this shear zone between the two of them um, is also, it turns out, important for the picture of what's happening here on the on the eastern ice shelf. Um, what we are seeing. Uh, if we go back in history of the of this coupled system, is that there were periods where this shear zone between the eastern and western part of the floating ice was much stronger. And in that case, the fast flowing western ice tongue was actually dragging the eastern ice tongue with it. Um, and we see this, and I'll I'll show you this in some of the, the satellite imagery. This is some work that Karen Alley did. Um, that was published recently this year and looking back through history. So we have to think about these marginal stresses as well. Um, that's instead of if we're just so that we're not just looking at the two dimensional version of these um, of these stresses. This is what it looks like and you'll see the, the satellite image of this in a minute. Um, but what has happened now is that this shear, um, this pinning point is now much more of a shearing stress and the ice is flowing this direction and we might have a little bit of buttressing from sea ice we don't we're looking into that right now but the pinning point is not really providing the same buttressing as it used to provide and in fact this um this uh greenish area i've highlighted has become mostly stagnant at this point so this is what that story looks like a bit more in um in uh in our in our satellite data, um, this is from Karen Alley's uh, Karen Alley's um, paper, and what she did was go back two decades into the history to look at the relationship between the western and the eastern part of the ice shelf, um, and what this shows 
here the on the right here is the um is the speed through time and the longitudinal strain through time so time here is on the vertical axis and then the horizontal axis is follows these flow lines um so this is the a flow line which goes out here towards this um, open area and the b flow line goes into the pinning point um and so this um this is from um, flow line B, the speed, and then the longitudinal strain rate. So this is this one that goes into the pinning point. And what this shows is that from about 2004, around 2004, we actually had quite a bit faster flow than we even have today. And that's because this Western ice shelf was pulling it along and causing it to accelerate. As soon as this shear margin broke free, um, then the speeds, uh, then the speeds slowed down again um, as we went through. And the pinning point here is on the left, and the grounded ice is on the right. So it was accelerating, and then it would would um, it was hitting the pinning point, which is why the speeds go to zero. But then, as soon as that, I, as soon as the coupling between the two sep uh, separated, this ice shelf slowed down to almost to quite a bit slower. And as you can see, it has been gradually accelerating um, up to today and or up to a couple of years ago. And then I'll show you in a little bit what, what it looks like today. Um, what this is, what this is showing, this is sort of shows the story in terms of um, in terms of pictures from map view pictures from the satellite. And this was in 2001, and here. We, you can see there's a lot stronger connection between the um, between the eastern and the western ice shelf. Um, once that connection, it pulled the ice shelf through, and actually at that time, it caused a bunch of fractures to form at the grounding zone because the ice was being pulled quickly, more quickly off the grounded ice um, than before. So this fracture zone was created. Uh, during that really fast flowing period of just a few years, and then it started to slow down again. And so the crevasses being formed at the grounding zone are much, much, um, are, are not nearly as visible, and that's this area here. So this is that crevasse swarm that was from a limited time period, and then we have more smooth ice upstream from it there. Um, now what we have is this loose, there's no shear zone here, and we're starting to form the shear zone here. And that's where we're forming these new rifts going through into the center of the ice sheet. And again, here's that crevasse swarm here. Um, what we have, what we are seeing is that as this crevasse swarm, this is now November, 2020, um, this crevasse swarm, which represents some damaged ice already is being advected into the center of this ice shelf. And these rifts are propagating into that area. And we are on track for the, this, this damaged area to, um, to intersect with these fractures, with these full thickness rift fractures in just um, in a limited time as it all is moving out. Um, the scale on this means that it could be as few as as five or eight years before these these come together, depending on how you project out the the um, the distance. So, just to show a little bit about what happened with the pinning point, um, this shows um, the changes in the pinning point in 2014 and then in 2019. And what this is showing is the height above flotation. So, how much of the area is actually grounded versus floating. So the pinkish areas are grounded ice, well-grounded ice. Um, so the pink area has reduced in size and the red outline is the newer 2020 outline and the green area was from 2014. So we can see that it is weakened. It's also shifted the flow direction as I've already mentioned. Um, this is a diagram that shows that shift in flow direction. Um, there's a few interesting things that happened here. When the pinning point was stronger, um, there already was some flow that went off to the side of the pinning point, but, uh, but it was still forming this stabilizing force here. As it thinned, 
um, there's a little bit of a shift uh, as it thinned and the pinning point became a weaker, a weaker resistance. There's more funneling of ice through this gap between the two pieces. There's more shedding of ice off to this southern part because the ice tongue is no longer here. And that allows this main part of the ice shelf to flow a bit faster and release itself. And this blue shading um, shows the weakening of that shearing, the weakening between this area, which becomes stagnant ice and this faster flowing ice. Um, so this is this is from uh, it's the nice work of uh, my postdoc Christian Wild um, that just came just came out this last year. So when we keep looking and trying to piece all these pieces together to tell a story, um, one of the other things we can do is look through the actual um, the speed of the ice from remote sensing. So this is from Sentinel velocities derived from Sentinel radar. Uh, and this was uh, something that uh, Adrian um, Luckman put together. And uh, he pulled off in this figure five points along the ice shelf um, that show from 2014 again up to 2021. And as you can see, all of these four are ex have, were stable for a for a few years here and then have been accelerating certainly since 2017 and accelerating even more since 2020. This blue star on the other side of that shear zone that was, that's was that been forming was initially accelerating along with the others, but then around 2019, it has mostly stopped accelerating. So that is that shows us that divide between the two parts of this ice shelf. And here is that same video. <laughs> um, we also had a GPS on the ground measuring and sending things back. And this is an Amigo station. And I see Ted's online, who's the, the chief uh, Amigos um, a designer. Uh, and um, what we found basically complements and provides a lot more detail to this, to this satellite remote sensing. So there's a lot we can do with satellites, but there's a lot more that we can get by being on the ground. And that's one of the things that we found during our, our work there in 2019-20. Um, what this shows is that this is now 2020. So this is just capturing the last of this part of the record. Um, we just haven't extended this one out. But it shows this, this acceleration and acceleration and acceleration. And this is where when we were there and we installed the Amigos, the speed here was about 600 meters per year. And it is now flowing. This was a couple, This was a few months ago. And it's now flowing um, over 900 and, and may almost be 1,000 meters per year. So again, that's a 50%, over 50% increase in speed in just the last three years. So there's clearly something going on um, in, uh, uh, in this area. So just to come back to this, not only has the flow change direction here, we've got this new shear zone, but this whole area in the middle has accelerated significantly. And that has, um, so that's tells you the details of the losing grip on the seamount. And now what I'm gonna show you is how the this acceleration has caused, um, triggered the shattering of the ice that uh, I've already alluded to, and we'll talk a little bit more about in detail. Um, so the acceleration, whenever you accelerate ice, you have to accommodate that somewhere. It's either gonna be a stretching of the ice itself or a fracturing. And in this case, um, we mostly see it fracturing. There's not a lot of, there's not a lot of, um, viscous shearing that we can measure um, in, this, in this central part of the ice shelf. Um, so I showed this earlier, but what I really wanna point out here is these five cracks that we have mapped out um, their, their, um, their propagation. There's another one here and another one here, you can see the iceberg calving. Um, I talked already about this crevassed weak zone, this damaged zone upstream. But it turns out I'll show you some radar that shows that upstream of that, there's already some weakening happening. Um, and the acceleration that we see today is also being accommodated by new um, gashes, we're calling them, upstream near the grounding zone. So there are new, very large, almost look like full thickness fractures um, 
way up at the grounding zone, uh, significantly more than have been present in the past. So here's those opening gashes. And the reason that we think they might be full thickness is that when we, when uh, the team flew over them this last year, they could actually see discoloration that was suggestive of basal ice popping up as the bergs rotated within these gashes. Oh, isn't this? There we go. So this is a zoom in of the shear zone um, showing uh, just the last few years showing how many new opening uh, open water areas are are um, being created here. And this is all as this is accelerating and as these are the daggers, what we call the daggers that have been propagating through. So it's a really rapidly changing area. Every week or two, we look at the satellite images to see what's happened next. Um, these fractures, it turns out, are propagating not just in a straightforward uh, uniform way, they are propagating in pulses. And so there's times when it is propagating as slowly as just a few hundred meters per year, and then they will jump up at six, seven kilometers per year here at upwards of, of almost 10 kilometers per year for just a month or two, and then they go back to a slow propagation. So these pulsed propagations have been ongoing this blue one is the longest moving, the longest propagating crevasse, the first one we noticed, but then each of these other colors show the propagation of these other ones. Um, <clears throat> and this, uh, this yellow one actually cropped up in between some of the others right at the last minute. So these two, the blue one and the yellow one are headed straight for our field camp. And at the moment, they're about three kilometers from our from the Amigo station where the GPS is and uh, and where we're planning on camping this year, so we are um, hoping and looking and watching that uh, we don't get another one of these accelerated uh, propagations in the next uh, couple of months. <clears throat> Oops, how am I doing on time? Eight thirty. Okay. Um, so again, these rifts are propagating rapidly, bursts of up to 10 kilometers a year. Um, as of last week, we don't see this rapid propagation, a, a jump in the propagation. And the one thing I've called this here a spring pulse, and that's because if you look at this, you'll see that each of these um, increases happen in either the late, uh, late, late winter or early spring each year. Um, including pretty much all of them have happened in that winter to, to late spring. And we think this might have to do with the, with, the, um, with the sea ice concentration on the outside, but that's a story that we're still, uh, still waiting to tell. And I think you can see them propagating here in a second. That red dot is our field site. Um, one of the nice things that we've uh, been trying to do is look at these changes with ISAT too, because it's a, it provides some pretty amazing data. The unfortunate thing is that it, there's only one or two, um, one or two ISAT two lines that go through our area of of interest. It turns out we sit right between some of the the flight lines, so we can't really get a picture of what's happening in the central part of the ice shelf, but it can give us a, a hint on what's happening through the edge of our area. And so we can actually see changes in the surface um, as things, as the, the icebergs are opening, as the rifts are opening and the, the iceberg is starting to calve in this case. So this is this one out here. And then as the, um, the crack, as this fracture is propagating towards, this is a basal channel, um, and it's getting deeper as it approaches. So this is something where we've been keeping an eye on. It, unfortunately, it doesn't go right through the most interesting part of our field site, but it is a powerful tool to keep an eye on. 
Um, okay, so this is a three-dimensional view, uh, sorry, a, a perspective view. Here's the satellite image, and this is our view angle. So we're looking not quite fully downstream with the ice, but we're looking almost in a direct line of the fractures that are coming at us. So if you flip your, if you imagine yourself standing right here and looking out at the ice shelf, this is what it, this is what it looks like. The ice flow is coming in this direction. This is that surface crevasse swarm that formed in 2004 to 2006. Our field site is right about there. Um, this is the pinning point way in the back. Um, the former ice tongue that's now the melange of icebergs is off here to the left. And then these new fractures that we call the daggers are propagating straight towards our field site here. What we learned on the ground a few years ago and what we're gonna go back and look into in more detail is that Despite us thinking this field site was a rather boring part of the ice shelf because it looked very smooth um, and fracture free, crevasse free on the surface, it actually has some really distinctive basal topography that is not not um, not visible, not we're not able to detect these with any of the satellite images. So this shows how we can bring together both ground based and satellite uh, um, remote sensing an analyses to tell the full story. So it turns out this crevasse swarm that we knew was damaged ice actually has ahead of it some, some damaged ice as well, but it just isn't visible. This is the ocean underneath. So I'm gonna show you the radar profiles that outline this, um, this pre, this damaged ice here that's ahead of the thicker ice that's out in the front. This is what one of these profiles looks like. So these are basal crevasses that have widened out through melting. Um, and they are, uh, they are a significant portion of the ice thickness. Um, we can't quite see the tips of the crevasses in most of these, um, but these are, these are pretty significant basal, um, basal crevasses that are not in hydrostatic equilibrium. So if we just took our bed, our surface topography from the various satellite in uh, various satellite and actually some ground-based GPS and assumed everything was in nice floating hydrostatic equilibrium, we would expect the bed would look like this. Um, and so that smooth blue line. What this shows us is that the bed on a smaller scale um, than we can see from the surface, the bed is out of hydrostatic equilibrium. And what that means is that it has some stresses that it's under because the ice wants to get back to that hydrostatic equilibrium. So the ice is sagging in these areas where it's where it's too thin and it's getting it's it's pushing itself up here. And that those um, internal stresses can lead to a additional weakening and uh, a propensity to fracture within the ice. Um, our rift, rifts are propagating in this direction and they are just a few kilometers from this first one of these. Um, and, uh, and we are imagining that these are going to uh, intersect uh, in the next few years. This is a, another version of this. this hidden zone that we didn't realize was as weak as it is. Um, this is a diagram from David Vaughn, a past paper by David Vaughn that shows how these stresses result in, in uh, internal stresses within the ice that are not just simple hydrostatic equilibrium. So if we come back to this big picture, um, I've talked about the losing grip on the seamount and I've talked about the shattering of ice. Um, I'm gonna to touch briefly on the melting by the ocean, uh, but that's a story that we are still trying to tell. Um, this is some work by Tiago Dado uh, that will hopefully be out soon, but it basically shows that the, the heat flux, there's, there is additional heat under the ice shelf as we expect from the warming of this whole area. Um, but it turns out we're not actually measuring much basal melt. So there is, there is very little basal melt that we can actually detect in this whole area, which is a little bit puzzling to us. Um, it's, it's pointing to some different processes going on um, over the last few years. This is from fiber optic digital, uh, sorry, distributed temperature 
that is through the ice and into the water. And we also have some uh, phase sensitive radar, radar that I'm not showing here, but they both tell the story of very little melt. So the next few years of this, of this ice shelf are really going to depend on the, the fracturing process and not quite as much sensi current sensitivity to, to melt. But again, we don't really have that full story behind us. Um, one last thing to show is um, that we, we were fortunate to have re, re-traveled a radar line from that was also flown by Icebridge back in 10 years, 10 years prior. And so we can see the thinning, overall thinning of the ice shelf um, between the red, which was in 2009, and the white profiles, which are uh, which were from 2019, 2020. Um, and what that tells us uh, that's a, somewhat of a similar story is that we're only seeing a half a meter to a meter of melt in this area, which is if we average over that 10 years, which again tells us that there's quite a bit less melt than maybe all of us realized, um, at least in the last few years. So, um, so I believe that that's very close to the end of my talk and I will um, stop here and uh, see what questions we have. Um, this synthesis is really just saying, okay, so where are we and what have we learned? Um, the rift zones, the propagating rifts and the weak zone will inter intersect in just one to five years. What's going to happen there, depending on um, how you look at the fracture interaction um, using linear elastic fracture mechanics or a more complex thought of damage mechanics, there's two possibilities. One is that though they will intersect and create a whole bunch of new fractures and the whole thing will shatter and fall apart. That's that's one possibility. The other possibility is that as the rifts get closer to that weak zone, um, it actually will somewhat blunt the propagation of the fractures. There's some interesting, um, the way fractures propagate is always more complicated than you want it to be. Um, so it really depends on the stresses right at that crack tip, whether it's gonna keep, keep whether those rifts are going to keep propagating. So um, I think that it's going to continue to fracture and break up, but I am um, uh, I also think that you, it could it could lead a little bit of blunting of those crack tip stresses. Um, so I don't want to say absolutely it's going to fracture and fall apart. We have learned that the basal topography is much more complex than apparent from the surface. Um, this is there's been hints of this scene on uh, Pine Island as well, but this uh, but this seems this complex of topography is potentially a um, a is potentially common on these these um, ice shelves that have been strongly affected by that are fast flowing and have been strongly affected by basal melt in the past. Um, this complex topography that isn't apparent from the satellite imagery does give us different clues to the internal stresses and melt patterns within the ice. Um, the basal melt, despite little basal melt, this ice shelf is probably still on track to breaking up in the very near future. Uh, it will be that structural, the structural stability and the propagation of cracks and the changing of the shear zone behind the ice, behind the pinning point that are, and these opening up of these gashes way upstream at the grounding line that are giving us clues that, that perhaps the melting is not driving this final breakup. It's going to be, it's going to be that fracturing that drives the final breakup. And again, the ice has already been accelerating just over the last few years. Um, our projection is that uh, as the ice shelf is, as this ice shelf um, breaks up, the eastern part of the Thwaites Glacier could accelerate to match its western friend over here and start flowing at upwards of 2,000 meters per year. And they will then again be flowing out together a, a bit more smoothly. I think that's all I have. Oh, there you can see the that again. And with that, I will take any questions. And Thanks very much, Dr. Pettit. Uh, uh, we do have a question from Vivian. Um, uh, yes, my, my question is uh, connected to the uh, picture that you showed of the uh, subsurface uh, 
uh, you know, initiation of what looked like crevasses. And I'm just wondering if these uh, will eventually uh, connect with the crevasses that you're seeing on the surface and, and that leads to the breakup of, of chunks of ice, et cetera. Um, so this, this might show, uh, although this isn't the actual data, um, this might show what you're asking a little bit more. So these crevasses on the surface are, the visible crevasses on the surface are actually slightly upstream of the ones that we see with radar. Um, these could propagate vertically upwards to the surface, but given that they haven't, they've propagated only uh, about 10 or 20 meters vertically in the last um, 10 years from our ice bridge, from comparison with past ice bridge data, I'm not necessarily expecting these to propagate vertically. We see no crevasses on the surface in this area. Um, what I'm more expecting is that these horizontally propagating fractures will come in and then that could trigger them to propagate all the way through. So as by themselves, I don't see them doing that anytime soon, but if they are intersected by this rift, then the stress along these, um, along this feature, because the fracture is gonna hit it in a perpendicular, almost a perpendicular direction, that it will trigger um, fractures all the way across. And yes, that's how I see it ultimately breaking up. Um, does that answer your question? Uh, yes. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Next, Dorothy. Yeah, hi. Thanks for a great talk. So in say 50 years, or I don't know what your estimate would be if that shelf goes back is that um, land-based, the rest of the Thwaites Glacier? And if so, what would you expect? Would it be calving into the ocean? Um, yeah, let me go back uh, to that nice. So the what we think will likely happen is that this part of the Thwaites ice shelf, the floating part of Thwaites, will start to look more like this Western ice tongue. And so here, the grounding zone you can see is way back up here and it very quickly fractures into a whole bunch of pieces. So this is calving and there are some people looking at the marine, um, the marine ice cliff instability in the case that this might be happening in which, um, in which it primarily will be a grounded calving front with very little floating ice. It won't float very much before it just falls apart if this, if this part ends up looking a bit like this, which is kind of where we project it will go. And then if that happens, it could trigger um, some of that ice cliff instability um, that has been suggested when you have too high of ice cliffs because the ice up here is pretty thick. Then those really elevated ice cliffs will rapidly can rapidly um, rapidly calve because, because you just can't sustain ice cliffs um, very high. So we could have some significant changes here as all of this happens. Thanks. Gavin? Hi, uh, thanks, for, thanks for that. Uh, slightly depressing. Um, a couple of questions. Uh, a, isn't there like some, like real risk of if you go back onto the ice that your ice shelf camp will disintegrate? I mean, like that, that's a, a kind of a personal exploration question. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't seem to me to be the safest environment to, to put <laughs> a bunch of instruments and people. Yeah, I, I mean, we are watching. So we do get um, the radar imagery every every six six days or 12 days. And we, have, we now have um, visible imagery coming in uh, now that it's it's summertime going into summertime there um, we are we are watching it very closely yes and um, and we will be able to uh, even once we're on the ground um, we will be able to detect it uh, before it gets too we think probably before it gets too close to us so I'm not expecting us to be probably be floating on a 
on an iceberg, uh, but there is there is the possibility that it will go too quickly. Um, but it's probably going to be two very two very straight. They're propagating quite straight right now. Um, so yeah, we are going to be watching it very closely. Um, but I think actually it's pretty safe for the time being. Um, most of these have propagated, uh, well, they're propagating at a rate of 10 to up to 10 kilometers per year during that spring month. That only extends it by like a kilometer or kilometer and a half. So even if it goes through one of those, we'll still be a little bit of ways. But we're going to set up some seismometers and GPSs to, um, to listen to that and watch it change. Right, because you guys are doing good stuff. It'd be it'd be a shame to lose you. So, <laughs> yeah. uh, so, uh, so, so the, the more technical question uh, that I had. So the 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 basal crevasses uh, look kind of surprisingly regular, um, and so I imagine that in the direction of the flow, the basal crevasses are going perpendicular to the direction of the flow. Yes. Um, do you have a sense that that this is something that's propagated? from the grounding line or that that there was like perhaps small perturbations at the grounding line and then those perturbations have uh have expanded in magnitude due to some um some some uh, you know some instability associated with the the you know the water and the different melting points and the refreezing and the melting and things like that <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good question. Um, you can see here, I've just deleted the middle part of the ice shelf. So you can see the near surface, the top 20 meters, and you can see the bottom uh, 50 meters here. And you're right that there is a regularity to these. They look like little wedding cakes. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and if we look at the current grounding zone, there are some fractures forming that are starting to have these little terraces, we're calling them, at the edges of the wedding cake, the little shoulders. Um, the ones that are at the current grounding zone look a lot more chaotic than these. And these also did have a little bit of surface fracturing probably at the time, but much less than the big swarm of crevasses that is just upstream. So what, what we are envisioning is that for this period, however many years it was, maybe just a couple of years, there was a bit of a, a modest stretching that created some modest basal crevasses and a little bit of surface crevassing, not as extreme as the other one. And then what we think happens is that the melting is um, dominantly on the vertical faces of this topography and it cracks and then it melts this way and then it sags in the middle and cracks again and melts this way and then it sags in the middle and then cracks this way and opens. Oh. Um, and that's what creates this regularity. If it has to do this under relatively calm currents because otherwise you would get a dramatic difference on the sides. Well, uh, there may be some tidal effects, right? There could be some tidal effects. Um, we have been working with the oceanographers on that, and they—they're not. I don't think so. They're, they're, these are about ten meters. Right. Each of these little shoulders is like an eight to ten meter um, jump, and the tides here are only one to two meters, and the time scale and the the um, and the shape. Oh makes it yeah they're super intriguing and we we don't have quite all of the so, answers so it, it does remind me of something else though so uh, i was on a i was on a cruise um on the nathaniel palmer to the mertz glacier tongue when the mertz glacier tongue was still there and uh one of the things that we did is that right close to the to the glacier we did some very um uh high resolution uh, ctd work right right mm -hmm. next to the right next to the ice and and what you see is this is this staircasing, right? So so what you see is that there's a uh, um, you know uh, the, the the stratification looks like a staircase. Yeah. And uh, and it's weird. And, and what we what we what we what we saw was that uh, there were these very um, very narrow uh, 
kind of horizontal circulations that would kind of like go in, go down and go out, go in, go down and go out, go in, go down and go out, uh, that was like stacked one on top of the other. So this was in a situation where, you know, I mean, that the actual uh, stratification was was almost zero, right? I mean, so so the, the salt and the temperature were, were balanced, you know, for, for hundreds of meters. Uh, and there was very little wind, right? So this is this is in the lee of the, um, uh, of the ice uh, of the ice tongue uh, and it's a kind of it's a natural polynia that opens up but it used to open up uh, before it so the Mertz, I mean I, I don't know, the Mertz glacier tongue got taken out by one of the big uh, one of the big icebergs <laughs> a few years ago um, uh, but you but you saw that 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 stacking and so so it's and, and that seemed to be driven by uh, you know water coming in melting at the I guess it, I guess the, the water been, would have been going in at the bottom, up a little bit, and then out a bit. Mm, right. Uh, as it, as it melted, kind of became more buoyant, and then kind of came out again at the new neutral buoyancy uh, thing. So so uh, so th th this that that could be related to that. It seems to be about the same scale. It's yeah. I I mean we are we are thinking about a lot of different things, and we have seen something similar um, actually up in my work in Alaska, uh, where we see those those circulations on like a twenty meter vertical scale, where you'll have um, a stack of them. Uh, so, so yeah, the, the stratification might play a role in this. Um, again, it's hard. Like it, it, we are, we're, we're, we don't have the final answer on these, but it's, it's some combination. Yes. Of those stratification like that. And, um, and then the, the scale might also be set by the typical fracture, um, the typical fracture length. Um, so it might be a combination of, just the right conditions to fracture about 10 meters and then to have this stable, um, relatively stable, stable stratification that does allow for the elevated um, melt on the on those vertical faces without without a lot of complicating currents around there to kind of mess up the pattern. Right. And uh, so, yeah. Have you, have you have you been able to drill into one of these crevasses and drop a CTD down? Well, we did actually. That's um, not quite in the, but the 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 distributed temperature profile that I showed you, and um, we do have some CTD casts. They were from the sh one of the shoulders here, um, and uh, and yeah, we drilled there before knowing these were all there. <laughs> so one of the things that we want to look at a little more closely this year is. Um, is doing closer radar work around our borehole because the the noisiness of the drilling meant that we couldn't get good radar right up to where the borehole was. Um, so we would like to put that in context, um, in the better context of where the CTDs are compared to compared to this um, compared to these shapes. So yeah, yeah, great. Well, uh, congratulations and. Uh... And uh, fingers crossed that uh, <laughs> your camp does not fall into the sea. Yeah, <laughs> well, thanks. <laughs> if anybody who see any satellite images of suggesting we're in trouble, give us a call. <laughs> <laughs> it would be like that uh, that first scene in the day after tomorrow when he's, exactly. like, he's on an ice shelf somewhere and suddenly this crack comes. And you're going, ah, and you've got to jump across with your paws. I really hope we don't do that. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much for the talk. It was fascinating. Yeah, thanks. Uh, we, I think we had another question from Vivian. Sure. Uh, uh, yeah, yes, I was just wondering if, if any of the uh, new observations that you've been uh, telling us about um, could be, um, be in some way related to the, uh, in, an initiation soon of a marine ice sheet instability. For Thwaites, um, I mean, we are the the Thwaites is set up topographically as far as we've been able to um, to image it upstream through ground penetrating radar and just looking at the whole system. It is it is geometrically set up for a really nice to follow like textbook marine ice sheet instability. It has very much the over deepened bed just upstream. Um, whether it actually moves into that this is where you know our work our work is really looking at that ice shelf in the in the very near future with that with the ice shelf area um the 
as we as the ice shelf breaks apart, we're going to look to our collaborators upstream who are studying the basal that basal drag um, that I mentioned, which is one of the next things that will help to hold the ice on the continent. And then the margins of the glacier upstream are the other things that provide resistive stresses that can help it hold. So how quickly it turns into this, um, it, it becomes unstable in a marine ice sheet uh, instability way will depend a lot on, on the basal drag and those margins of the ice sheet. Um, and we are, um, are, there's gonna be two teams down there this year really doing a lot of detailed work um, trying to understand the basal conditions and those marginal, the marginal parts of the ice of the glacier. So, so that's the best answer I can give. Stay tuned. <laughs> no, thank you. Okay, well, I don't see any more questions. So I guess we could wrap it up. <laughs> so thanks again, Erin. Yeah, <laughs> happy to do it. So yeah, and if anyone else has questions,